Bibles open to Romans chapter number 15. Romans chapter number 15. And we're going to look at this morning and a sermon that I've entitled Diagnosis Hope. A man approached a little league baseball game one afternoon. He asked a boy in the dugout what was the score and the boy responded 18 to nothing, we're behind. Boy, the spectator said, I bet you're discouraged. And the boy responded, why should I be discouraged? I haven't even gotten up to bat yet. I like that outlook. I like that mentality that uh, we've not even got up to bat yet. You may not realize this, but we're in, a, in the midst of a little bit of a crisis right now. Maybe you didn't realize that uh, things are a little bit crazy out there right now, and I jest because I think we can't turn one way or the other without seeing something about this virus. In fact, I was watching a news organization the other day, and on the side of the screen, while they were running some news articles, it said, this coronavirus pandemic. You'll see those words like pandemic, panic, virus, global, things like that. Fatalities, dangerous, that if we're not careful, will cause us not to have hope. Hope, what an elusive idea, what a, what a kind of a, an idea that, that sits out there that sometimes we want to have it, but we don't know how to have hope. We use that term loosely in this culture. Uh, sometimes, well, I, I hope that it doesn't rain tomorrow. What we mean by that is uh, we hope it doesn't, but we have no control over it, whether it does or it doesn't, or at least I've not figured out how to have that control yet. There are days that I want it to rain. There are days that I don't want it to rain. When uh, my grass outside is full of water and my front yard is another pond in my yard, I don't want any more rain. When my grass is parched, I want more rain. But we can't control the weather. We might say to someone who's leaving, well, I hope to see you tomorrow. We might infer that there are some plans and if everything works out, we'll see you. But in the Bible, when the word hope is used, it's not talking about an elusive idea or even just a maybe a cursory plan that we have or even something that we have no control over. Hope, when it's used in the Bible, is talking about something about confidence, about an idea that we can have in a confident God. And this morning, I want us to have the diagnosis of hope. The book of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul. It was written to a group of people that will very shortly suffer some serious persecution at the hand of Nero. Nero was a bad man and at that point they would be hunted and persecuted and tracked down and killed. There's a background for hopelessness, yet here in Romans chapter number 15 we find a diagnosis of hope. I look at today in March 22nd, 2020, and I see a backdrop of potential hopelessness. Uncertainty in jobs, families, and lives, and maybe even some freedoms. And unsettling in society and even just the basic, we would say basic necessities. Food and water, toilet paper. An unstable culture. Everyone kind of looks at everyone else when they cough. And they know when they, when they hear that cough, that's the coronavirus. And I see an unsettling, unstable, and uninformed there is a lot of fake news out there too. A backdrop of hopelessness. Yet this morning I want to give us a diagnosis of hope. A diagnosis is the identification of the nature of an illness or another problem. That's a diagnosis. And I would submit this morning that I would encourage us to have an illness of hope. Something that's not natural. What would be natural would be to respond in anxiety and to respond in panic. But if someone has hope, it will not be a natural response. It will be a supernatural response. So we don't believe everything we read or see or don't listen to everything we hear, but believe in something else. In Romans chapter number 15, where the Apostle Paul wrote in verse number 13, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, I thank you for this time, Lord, for these next brief few minutes. I pray that our hearts would be touched by your word. Lord, you are a God of hope, help, and comfort. And I ask that you would touch us this morning. Lord, help me to say those things that would be helpful and beneficial. Lord, I pray for everyone who's here in the auditorium with me and those who are watching, that our hearts would be tender to you. And to your word, would your spirit work in and through me and in and through us? In Jesus' name I ask, amen. 
diagnosis hope. There was a philosopher by the name of George Orwell, and he wrote that for 200 years, we have sawed and sawed and sawed at the branch we're sitting on. What he meant by that was that, in a sense, we're suspended over our own ideas and efforts, and by our philosophical ideas and thoughts, we're sawing at that branch. And he said, we fell down, and we thought we were to be rewarded, but we found out that at the bottom, it was not a bed of roses at all. He said it was a cesspool full of barbed wire. Have you ever wanted something really badly, and, and when you finally got it, it wasn't quite what you thought it was going to be? I've done that before. I've, I've found something, and I'm a researcher. And I'll research it online. I'll read every single review known to man. If it's on Amazon, I'll read the good. I'll read the bad. I'll read the ugly. I'll read them all. I'll feel like I have a pretty good picture of this item I'm getting. And then when it shows up, sometimes I'm disappointed. This thing of hope. Can I submit this morning that, that as I challenge us to believe in this hope that God brings, that you will never and I will never be disappointed. I want to introduce you to the first thing of this, that there is a God of hope. I ask that we would choose to trust and believe in the God of hope. That's what the verse says, now the God of hope. Choose to trust and believe in this God. You see, we all make choices to believe in something that, or something or someone. Now, some choose to believe everything they read and hear. I read a couple of conspiracy theories this, this past week. One said that Bill Gates and Microsoft created the coronavirus. Now, I knew Bill Gates was a rich man. I didn't know that he also committed many viruses. And, but you can find just a plethora of ideas. And, uh, of course, it was, they, they said it was another one it was created in a, in a, as a bio-weapon of, of sorts. Uh, one church member who may be watching this morning jokingly said that I created the virus so that church members would move different seats in the auditorium and meet other people. Well, I tell you what, I don't have that much power and I'm not that smart. One person has said that we're not in a pan, not only in a pandemic, but also an infodemic. All right, just thoughts all over the place. You see, some people choose to believe everything they read and hear. Those are incredibly interesting people, are they not? They bring some of the, the, the strangest thoughts to the table, some of the craziest ideas, and, uh, and, and, they, and, and you have no argument for some of those people because they look at you if you try to, to argue with them or bring sense to them and say, oh, you're just, you're just one of them. I wonder if maybe they have foil hats sometimes as well to block out all of the, the waves coming at us. Some choose to trust themselves. I can beat this, I can scratch and crawl my way out of this, I can stockpile enough to make it through. I'm asking us to choose and to trust and believe in the God of hope, not what we read in here, not what we see, and not ourselves. Let me introduce you to this God of hope. He's a creator in Genesis chapter number one. He made all things good. I'm asking that you would look to him. On the sixth day of the Apollo 13 mission, the astronauts needed to make a critical course correction. If they failed, they would never return to Earth. Some of you know the story. To conserve power, they shut down the onboard computer that steered the craft. Yet they needed to conduct a 31 second burn of their engine, or 39 second burn of the main engines. There was no computer to guide them. They had to choose something to put their focus on so they would stay the right course, stay the right direction. They chose to keep their eyes on where they were headed, a little place called Earth. Of course, you know the story. For 39 agonizing seconds, without any computers, with no other help but their own eyesight and their own uh, engines going on, they kept the reference point and avoided disaster. I love that thought because if we can focus on the God of hope in the midst of a crazy society, unsettling society, if we can focus on the God of hope, he'll keep us on the right course, on the right track. He's the creator in Genesis chapter 1. He's the redeemer and the rescuer in Exodus. He brings order in Leviticus. He's to be praised in the book of Psalms. You see, this God of hope is a good God. Throughout the Bible, we're introduced to the goodness of God when he created the world. In Genesis 1, everything he did, he called good. He said, that's good, and that's good, and that's good, and that's good. 
The only thing that he didn't like at first was when he created Adam, he said it's not good for man to be alone, so then he made Eve. And I'm thankful for a wonderful wife. Boy, she's a blessing in my life, and, and not only for all she does, but for who she is. God is a good God. In the midst of troubling times with Noah, God showed his goodness. Joseph, the character in the Bible, Joseph, he had a dysfunctional family. We can identify with that, can't we? A dysfunctional family. A family that you may not want to eat Christmas dinner with. That was Joseph's family. And yet God showed his goodness. In fact, Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for, for good. Job, we see God's goodness as he preserved his servant. Esther was used to save a nation. King David and the prophets, all the way up to Jesus, God is a good God. The God of hope is a good God. And God's goodness becomes clear in times like this. Not only does he have goodness, but he is a God of love. The Bible tells in, in 1 John chapter number 4 that God is love. You say, oh, pastor, I like that one. I like the fact that God loves me and he loves all of us so much. The Bible tells me that we love him because he first loved us. John 3, 16 tells me, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Boy, God loves each one of us so much. He loves you and he loves me. He loves us, but he loved us before we were born. He loved us before we knew ourselves. God is a God of love. This God of hope is a God of love. See, the Bible tells us that we're all rotten people. We're rotten people. I'm rotten. You're rotten. The Bible says this, we're all sinners. You say, Pastor, are you really a rotten person? Well, don't ask me and definitely don't ask my wife. All right, yeah, because she will tell you that sometimes I leave socks on the floor instead of putting them in the hamper. But the fact is, the fact is we're all rotten people. We're all sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What that means is because of that sin, because we've done something to offend a holy God. And the Bible says if we've offended at one point, we are guilty of all. You say, well, pastor, I've never murdered anybody and I hope you haven't. But if you have, God can still forgive you. You say, well, pastor, I've only told some lies. I've, I've never robbed a bank, and I hope you haven't, but God can still forgive you. If you've even told just one lie, then we're a sinner. We're a rotten person. But you know that God still loved us. In fact, the Bible tells me, but God commendeth. He showed his love toward us in that while we, that means me and you, were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, I have a good God of hope because he's a loving God and he sent his son Jesus to die for me and to die for you. We are all sinners and the Bible says for the wages of sin is death. That word death there means separation, separation from God. We don't deserve, I don't deserve to go to heaven. I'm not good enough to go to heaven. I get the privilege of pastoring a wonderful church. And some would say, I would not, but some would say, well, you're a pastor, so you must be going to heaven. But my Bible says that, that for me, I deserve to pay for my own sin, and that is to be separated from God. But the Bible tells me that God loved us so much, he sent his son Jesus to die for you and to die for me. And the wages of sin is death, but the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, God is such a good God, such a loving God. He gave us a gift. And that gift, his name is Jesus. Amen. He came to earth, and I wonder if you've heard of Jesus before. Was born to Mary and to Joseph. Mary being his mother and Joseph his earthly father. Jesus had a father. His name is God. He is the son of God. He came to earth and he lived a perfect life. Can you imagine that? Never sinning a single time. Never having a bad attitude. Never getting in a single fight never taking something that wasn't his, and never telling a lie? Can you imagine being in the same household with someone who's perfect? I have an older sister, and sometimes I felt like she was perfect, though she wasn't. But he lived a perfect life. At the end of his life, he died on the cross. And he died on the cross to pay for not for his sin, because he was perfect, but to pay for my sin and for your sin. 
Because he was perfect, he could pay for someone else's sin. And because he is God and the Son of God, he can pay for everybody's sin. And then they buried him in the grave, and for three days he was there. But then God raised him up from the dead, and now he's in heaven. And the Bible says the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's life in heaven forever and ever, and it's only through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved from paying for your own sin. Saved from that separation. And today, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, would you trust Him today? Would you admit that you're a sinner? And, and usually, that's not the hard part. We all know that we've done some wrong things. But would you ask Him to save you? If you ask Him today, the Bible says, for whosoever, that means you. I can put my name there for J.D. calls upon the name of the Lord. I shall be saved. I did that when I was six years old. You may be watching today and you don't know if you've got a home in heaven. You can trust Christ today. You can believe on His name today. You can ask Him to save you. And the Bible says He will. You see, we have a God of hope because He's a loving God. There was a man who was on an airplane. He happened to sit down to a, another man. And as they began to talk, he found out this other man was part of a Middle Eastern religion. As they began to talk, the first man asked the other man, he said, can you sum up your religion in one phrase, one line? And this other man said, yes. He said, I'd sum it up this way. We are all part of the problem, and we are all part of the solution. As they continued to talk, the man who uh, gave that line asked the first man, a Christian, and he said, how would you give one line to capture the Christian faith? And the man responded, I would say it this way. We are all part of the problem, but there is only one man who is part of the solution, who is the solution, and his name is Jesus. Amen. Alexander White, a biographer, said this, that we have a tendency to hang very heavy weights on very thin wires. That we often hang the very heavy weight of our happiness on our health and the very uh, heavy weight of our peace on a very thin wire of our possessions, and the very heavy weight of our security on the very thin wire of our savings. Our health can be affected by something as small as a virus or a blood clot. Our possessions can be gone in a moment via the stock market or a fire or robbery. And yet there was a man... His name was Yusuf, the terrible Turk, a 350-pound wrestler. He won a big match in America and he insisted on being paid his $5,000 in U.S. gold coin. He was nervous about it being stolen, so he stuck this, this large sat, uh, sachet of, of gold coins inside of his belt. He then boarded a, a boat and began to head back to Europe. The ship, as the story goes, began to be in trouble and began to sink. And as the ship listed to the side, Yusuf, the terrible Turk, plunged overboard. But before the rescue boats could get to him, he was pulled underneath by the heavy weight of those gold coins. Snap with a thin wire of Turk's savings. I encourage you this morning, I challenge you this morning, I uh, implore you this morning to choose to hang the weight of every problem of your life, not on the thin wire of your health or your prosperity, but on the very thick wire of Jesus Christ and the hope that he brings. You see, we have a God of hope. And he's a good God and he's a loving God. I want to look at briefly, though, there's the gifts of hope in this verse. It says, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. I think we can see a determination of joy. There is goodness because God is in control. This is exciting because we get to see God work. This will end out okay because God is still God. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. My kids have learned to trust me when I tell them we're going crazy. I don't know where, I think I picked it up from my dad years ago. Well, my wife and I will plan something and we'll plan a trip or some other something to, to go somewhere, some fun thing. Want to surprise the kids. We'll say, okay, kids, load up. Where are we going, Dad? Crazy. We're going crazy. They know that crazy equals good. 
Crazy doesn't mean we're going to go weed a field. Crazy doesn't mean we're going to go do some work. Crazy means maybe we're going to a restaurant. Maybe we're going out of town. We're doing something crazy. They look forward to crazy. God is a good God and he brings joy in circumstances because what he does, he does well. Determination of joy and there's a determination of peace. The Bible says, be still. Be still and know that I am God. It is good that a man both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. That means not to let my mind run a marathon. It means to focus on God. Yesterday I got to go outside and run for about three and a half miles, a little over three and a half miles. Beautiful day out. What was it, 55 on Thursday and 55 or 56 on Friday and 30 on Saturday. That's Michigan, right? Snow in the morning. Haven't had that for a few weeks and snow came yesterday. So why not go for a run? It was a good run and enjoyed it out there. And it was good to get my mind cleared. I, I don't listen to music when I run. I run just me and my heavy breathing. So I know I'm still alive. And uh, I made it the whole way. Didn't stop to walk and, and uh, didn't have any crazy times running either. But I'm, as I'm running, I'm praying as I run and just thinking over this sermon for today and just get my mind focused. And isn't, it, isn't it sad sometimes how our minds can just run all over the place in fear and just random ideas? You see one little news article and your mind goes all the way to the end of it. You know we're getting locked up in our houses without any food, no toilet paper. It's stuck with our families. How bad can it be? Well, see, when you have a God of hope, you can trust in Him. You can sit yourself down and relax in the gifts of hope, of joy, and peace. And lastly, I see a guarantee of hope. The verse says that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. The Bible uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, um, enlarge things. The Bible always tells the truth, and it wants us to abound in hope. That means it wants us to be supersized in hope. We live in a culture of downsizing. Now, not downsizing houses. People are buying bigger, bigger houses. And we're not downsizing vehicles. We're buying bigger vehicles. But they're downsizing our products at the grocery store. Tortilla chips used to be sold as a 16-ounce bag, and now typically they're a 12.5-ounce bag for the same price or more and the same size bag. This is awful. Powerade went from a 32-ounce bottle to a 28-ounce bottle. And this one right here, this is, talk about price gouging, ice cream sandwiches. They touched the ice cream sandwiches they did are now, they say, from a 12-count box down to a 10-count box. What will they do next? I know what they'll do. They'll take the Briar's ice cream that used to be a half gallon and make it less. That's what they do. But see, this hope that God brings has never been downsized, and it never will be downsized. It won't be shrunk. It's from our God. We have a confidence in who God is, a confidence for what God will do, a joy found only in Him, a surreal calmness in the midst of crazy, and the amount of hope is super abundant. It is overflowing. See, we can have a diagnosis of hope because there's a God of hope who brings the gifts of hope and a guarantee of hope. No one who knows what can happen at sea. What happened to go to sea in a vessel that carried no anchor? Even though we're the greatest or most modern liner afloat, for circumstances might arise when the hope of the ship and all her company would depend not on the captain or the crew or the engines, the compass, or the steering gear, but on the anchor. You see, when all else has failed, there is hope in the anchor. When all else has failed, there is hope in our God. Amen. Do you have hope today? The God of hope can bring you hope. Perhaps you're a Christian who's allowed your mind to run and run a whole lot of miles. Can I encourage you to run back to, to Jesus, run back to God? He's the God of hope. Maybe you've allowed your emotions to run all over the place. Come back to the God of hope. Place your trust back in the God of hope. You see, our theme this year for First Baptist Church is, I believe God. Or maybe you're listening this morning, and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You never asked Him to save you from your sins. He wants to be your God today, your God of hope. Lord, I thank You for Your Word. 
I thank you that you are a God of hope. Lord, I pray that you would touch us this morning. Lord, I imagine there's someone listening today who's never trusted you as their Savior. Lord, I pray that you would touch their heart, that you would help them to realize how much you love them, what a good God you are. If you're out there listening this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, could I encourage you to do that today? Sometimes here at First Baptist Church, we help someone in a simple prayer. It's not in the words that save you, it's in the belief in your heart. But we leave in a prayer like this, Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that you died on the cross for me. Would you save me and take me to heaven and forgive my sin? I trust you and you alone. I wonder this morning if you could pray that prayer and mean that from your heart. Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. I know that I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that you died on the cross for me. Would you please save me? Forgive me for my sin. Please take me to heaven when I die. I trust you and you alone. You can tell him that. He'll hear you. If you asked him that today and you meant that from your heart, we'd love to hear about that, to encourage you. We'd love to send you some material that help you grow as a Christian. How about you, Christian? This God that you've believed in before, are you believing in now? Is he still the God of hope? Lord, I pray you'd help us. Lord, search our hearts. May we trust you as a God of hope. The piano will play for just a moment. As the piano plays, I encourage you. If you need to pray, you pray. If you need to center your mind back on the God of hope, Thank you for all the folks who were able to participate in the service here and online. Lord, I pray that you would help them and bless them. Lord, we're so thankful for your goodness to us, that you're the God of hope. Lord, may we live for you and show an example of what a Christian looks like. In Jesus' name, amen.